Today, I'm gonna to talk about one of my favorite things to invest in, and that is overnight rentals or vacation rentals. Uh, I own a few, I have a ton of fun with them. Uh, I don't know that I would say that they're the absolute best investment per se, uh, but uh, it is something I, I really enjoy doing. And as part of that, there have been a number of platforms that have popped up on the market over the years uh, recently uh, that allow kind of the average person to invest in vacation rentals and other rental properties for as little as like a couple hundred bucks. And incidentally, both of the, the tow top platforms arrived and here are both also raising equity crowdfunding, which allows you to invest in their company uh, as well as, a, as an investor, as an individual, without having to be accredited. And so I thought it'd be kind of fun to evaluate both the platforms as well as the companies themselves uh, for investment uh, and give you my thoughts. Now, please remember this is not investment advice. This is entertainment and educational purposes only, but hopefully you can see the things that I'm thinking about as a venture capitalist and as a real estate investor as I evaluate these different investment opportunities. So first, we're gonna jump into Arrived. Now, Arrived has been around uh, for, for a little while, and they're arguably one of the largest platforms for this type of service. Um, here you can see they've got uh, over almost 300,000 registered investors, 266 properties that have been funded, $97 million of property value. Um, so let's dive into one of their properties. Click here to invest. Let's dive into the Seafoam. It's currently raising. Let's see, they've got 1,300 investors that have funded 78% of it. So they've got about $231,000 left. Uh, and let's just break down this deal. So looks like it is a beautiful home with a pool in Panama City, Florida, which is just off the Gulf Coast. Gulf Coast, uh, looks beautiful inside, although these are all virtual images, so who knows what it'll ultimately end up looking like on the inside. You know, this looks like a fun property uh, in a cool destination. I could see the appeal of going on vacation here and owning a vacation rental here. Purchase price of eight fifteen. You know, buying something kind of near the ocean in a beach town for eight fifteen in the U.S. doesn't sound too crazy from a cost perspective. Uh, like I said, it's got a pool, it's got balcony, big backyard, driveway, ten minute walk to beach access. That's all great. Uh, as part of the deal, they are not taking on leverage at least immediately. And then they have a third party that will do the property management. This is kind of an interesting choice. Uh, I would have thought that they would do the property management themselves, but I guess they outsource that and believe that somebody else can do it better, more affordably than they can. All right, they are forecasting a 5.5 to 12% annualized return. Uh, that's probably, yep, a mix of both rental income and appreciation of the property. Um, they're anticipating $126,000 in annual rent. Um, that feels, that feels, yeah, that feels reasonable for the size of this house. This is a, it's a four bedroom, three and a half bath. So yeah, that, that feels about right. 76,000 in operating financial legal AUM fees and expenses. So that feels really high. I mean, that's like 60% of total revenue is going off to expenses. Now, to give you some context, if you don't, if you don't own a vacation rental, so like, like my vacation rentals, I run them and manage them myself uh, because frankly, I've used a lot of software and built systems and so forth that really it's just not that much time uh, or effort on my part. Um, but if I were to hire an agency to do it, they would charge me somewhere between, call it 20 and 25%. Um, and then, you know, you do have reserves that you have to set aside for, you know, maintenance and everything else, but it's not 60%. I mean, at most it's maybe like 40% total, including, uh, management fees. So this 60% 
to me, feels really high. Um, if we click here, it looks like it's including tax and audit expenses, LLC registration expenses, interest if they end up borrowing money, property insurance, management services, taxes. So, I mean, yeah, there are a lot of these expenses, but, um, but they feel really high. And part of like what's going on in my head is the, the real value that Arrived, in my opinion, is offering is the ability for people to invest you know, a few hundred dollars, a few thousand dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, instead of forking out, you know, the full purchase price of this property, which is 815,000. Uh, and so what are you paying for, for that benefit of being able to invest a lower amount of money? And, you know, it's things like LLC registration expenses, AUM expenses, et cetera, that you are paying to the company for the privilege of being able to invest a lower amount. Uh, which, you know, begs the question, is it better to just save up your money and buy one property or is it better to not have to save up your money, start investing right away and get a diversified set of properties? And frankly, I think there's, there's a lot of logic in both approaches, um, but something to think about for sure. So we go through this, that leaves you with $49,500 of anticipated cash flow and dividends uh, and then they need to raise $1.1 million. So this is kind of a surprise to me. So $1.1 million, but the property only costs eight hundred and fifteen. dollars So where does that additional one point, let's see, call it, I mean, really three hundred grand go to? Uh, it's a little less than that. Um, yeah, we'll want to we'll want to figure that one out as we go through through this. Here they've pulled data from AirDNA, which is a really popular forecasting tool. Uh, I've used it. Do use it. Uh, so this is where they're getting their kind of average um, monthly revenue. So yeah, so about twelve thousand dollars per month times twelve, right? That's where you're getting this hundred twenty six thousand. Um, Occupancy rate about 56% on average. Let's see, good market. Okay, here we go, offering details. This is what I wanna know. So purchase price is 815. Then they're gonna plow in $173,000 for cash reserves and property improvements. Closing costs, offering costs, and holding costs are 70,000, and then you have the arrived sourcing admin fee, which is $40,000. So basically what's happening is they found the property for 100 or 815. They're going to, then they have to go in and they have to like, you know, put in chairs and tables and stuff like that. I will say like $170,000 for like, property improvements and furniture and so forth feels kind of like a lot. Uh, I would be curious if they have make any margin in that. Uh, and then they have closing costs, offering costs, holding costs. My guess is that they're probably capturing some of the revenue of that. And then of course, as revenue, and then they also have this $40,000 fee. So, you know, you're kind of, let's say that like property improvements and so forth are just all in it. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like you could do this a lot cheaper, um, but you know, it makes sense. They're, they're pulling out kind of their pound of flesh. Uh, and then the way that they make money is they have their AUM fee. So they're getting paid uh, about 5% annually of the purchase price. So that equates to about four, four grand. And then 5% of gross rents, so that's another like six grand. So they're making about $10,000 uh, every year on this property, although this is quarterly. So this 5% gross, hmm. I would be curious if this 5% is paid on a quarterly basis or if it's annualized, um, because is it 5% or is it 20%? <laughs> um, if it's 20%, all of a sudden, now you're talking about 24,000. That would actually make a little bit more sense if we go back up here you know, because it's 60% of their AUM fees. Um, yeah, that, that, that actually kind of might make more sense. Um, 
because they're going to pay 15% to Rosius. Um, so 15% plus another 20% plus another 5% on top of that. So, you know, that's 40% right there. And then you have um, insurance and taxes and audit fees. And that, that would be another 20%. So that, that actually makes sense. So this company is pulling out 20%, well, call it 25% of the, the revenue of the property every year as their revenue. I mean, and that's, that's money that's not going to the owners of the property. Um, so something to think about. Um, I think one of the most important things you can do when you're looking at these is to evaluate the circling, the offering circular, which I think very few people do. I mean, it's not that I think they're trying to hide anything, but it is kind of buried here at the bottom. I mean, they provide all this other stuff, pictures, graphs. Um, I actually love how much detail they put into here in terms of like really outlining a lot of the numbers. Uh, I think that's great. Um, but there's a lot more data to be captured in the circular. So in the circular, we can kind of flip through and we can see uh, a bunch of their other homes. So they have this series. So what's happening is the company is setting up a series of LLC structures uh, via SPVs. And SPV is a single purpose vehicle. Essentially what they're doing is they're gonna have like this master LLC agreement uh, and then each time they buy one of these properties, they're spinning up a new LLC that sits as a series underneath the master. So as you're reading through this and it says series properties, that's what it's referring to is that each time they buy one of these, it's a series that sits inside the master. Um, so offering size, membership interests. Um, yep, yeah, that all makes sense. Uh, our investment and our objectives are consistent cash flow, long-term appreciation uh, with moderate to no leverage and capital preservation. One of the things I wanted to look at was if we look at their historical returns. So I just thought this was interesting because if you're going to invest in this property, you want to know how good of investors are they because you're essentially paying them 20% a year of the gross proceeds, the revenue, uh, for, of this business in exchange for their supposed expertise at finding good properties, renovating them, getting them ready, putting them on the market. By the way, they're already getting paid 40, you know, 40 K in this particular case. So about 4% um, of the property value to do a lot of this work as well. So what do you get in exchange for this? How good are they at doing their job? And so if we look at all their properties, uh, these are really good returns, right? Uh, and it, so it's obvious that they would put these at the, the forefront, you know, 115% total return, 108.5% total return. But look how long they've held these. They've held them for about two years, which makes total sense because property values about two years ago were quite a bit lower than they are today. In fact, property values across the board, if you look at Zillow and you look at like trend charts, you had a huge jump just on the last call it 24 months. And so this was like perfect buy, t you know, perfect timing on their part to buy these properties. Uh, what's interesting though, is as you go down this list and you can see property values start to rise by the total return starting to decline. Uh, total of all time appreciation obviously hasn't had as much time to go up. And you can see that like, so two things are happening. If they have 115% total returns, 101% of that total return is coming off of appreciation, 8.1% from annualized rental income. Um, I would expect annualized rental income to be higher too at this point because you're able to buy these properties for less. And people have been, you know, thanks to work from home and remote work and all that stuff, they've been working out of Airbnbs more than ever. And so, you know, I would expect the annualized rental income as a percentage of total invested to be higher because you're buying in at lower, uh, lower prices in these units. So, but as you can see, as you go down over time, this starts to come down. The total returns start to come down. To all time appreciation starts to come down. 
that makes sense because it's two things. One, they haven't been in market as long, but the other thing is they're just buying these properties at higher values. As we keep going, what's interesting is not only do these appreciation numbers drop uh, more and more and more, but as we get closer and closer to like the more like today, uh, you start to see these numbers actually go negative, which would infer that like you bought they bought this peanut property in Tuscaloosa at the height of the market and they've already seen it drop. Um, I will give them kudos for like being willing to put put out the data and say like, oh yeah, our property has dropped by this amount because they're they're just gonna they have to use comps in order to figure that out. It's not like they sold the property and they know for sure that it's dropped by 17.8%. They're just estimating. Um, annualized rental income is still positive, which you would expect because they're still renting it, uh, which is good. Uh, but man, you're you're dipping down into the like 3.2%. If we go to like some of the most recent properties, those that have been around for just a few months, there's they're showing positive uh, rental income, which is good. Awaiting valuation, it's probably just too early to put you know a new valuation on there. So yeah, I wouldn't expect that to change much until they hit at least six months. Um, but it looks like you're seeing negative uh, valuations. Now, they, here's what they're going to argue. They're going to argue like, hey, look, this is a short-term dip and then things will come up. And then, frankly, they're probably right. But it is something to think about because if, you know, going back to our seafoam property here, they're forecasting 4.5%. That's kind of in line with what they're seeing. It's maybe on the higher end of some of their properties. Uh, but are they going to be able to see as much appreciation as they have, you know, from the properties they bought two years ago? I doubt it. Uh, that said, now's probably not the worst time to be buying because if you look at property values, they've kind of gone up and now they're starting to come down. And so now is actually a pretty interesting time to be buying. All in all, I think this is an interesting platform if you're not in a position to be able to invest um, into a property and own the entire property yourself. I mean, I think taking a 40K hit plus 20% every year off the top, plus you're paying another 15% to the manager uh, feels like a lot. I mean, ultimately that's, that's paying out 40% every year that could be money that you put in your pocket. Um, it feels pretty expensive. Uh, but again, if, if like this is your only opportunity to invest in this type of real estate, uh, then I think it can make sense. I think you just have to be okay with the fact that on a blended basis, you're going to be generating, like they say here, somewhere between a 5.5 to 12% uh, annualized return. Keep in mind, you can invest in you know the S&P 500 and over the long run, it returns somewhere between 8 and 12% annually. Now that's over the long run, you gotta hold it, you know, for probably at least like five to 10 years to start seeing that average return. Um, but it is something to consider, right? Uh, the S&P 500 is gonna be a lot less risky than, you know, buying into one house in Panama City, Florida. Anyways, let me know, what do you think? Do you, do you like Arrived? Have any of you that, that are watchers on my channel have you invested through Arrived? What do you think of the platform? What do you think of the opportunity? Uh, is it worth it? Not worth it? I'd uh, love to hear your comments down below. So this video is part of a series that I'm doing on the battle of vacation property rental platforms. Uh, so be sure to check it out. Thanks.